Uh, we'd like to welcome you all to the May uh, 2014 SagmonValley.net user group. Um, before we get started, we'd like to thank our um, sponsors that help make uh, these events possible. Um, first of all, Capital Strategies um, for providing the facilities and, and the video equipment. And then also um, LRS for uh, providing us our Office 365 account. Um, so tonight we've got a great talk lined up. Um, Mark Lovick is a senior developer over at Horace Mann. Um, he's been developing for many years, and he's, uh, uh, I've worked with him personally over at DOT, and um, he's done many great uh, presentations for us tonight, and tonight he'll be talking to us about uh, JavaScript. So uh, I hope you all are exci as excited as I am to see what he has to bring us tonight. And without further ado, welcome back, Mark. Thank you. Today is likely to be my shortest talk. We'll see how that goes. A um, couple things didn't work, but the other thing that I've done traditionally is I want to talk about a topic, and if you think about JavaScript, it's kind of large. Um, it's kind of like the Earth. You know, if you talk about the Earth, you say, okay, we could have the North Pole. That's the Earth. We could have the Sahara Desert. That's the Earth. We could have Mount Everest. That's the Earth. Or it could be a cornfield in Indiana. They don't look much the same. Well, if you look at JavaScript, and one of the things that just ticks me off is, if you ever notice, it's not that there isn't information on JavaScript on the web. There's too much. And you can never sort out what's good, what's bad, or all the differences between the different platforms. And it turns out there's an analog, I'll tell you at the end, that it seems like we're going back to the past. And in some cases, we're regressing because JavaScript is least common denominator, and I'm not an expert, and I don't think you really can be an expert, because as soon as you're an expert in part of JavaScript, there's something you know nothing about because it's so stinking big. So the question that I've got today is can we think about how to get productive and go from being a Java hack, you've always heard like, you, you know, you might be a redneck if, okay, you might be a Java hack if you just write simple methods and you just throw it around on your page. That's pretty much a Java hack or JavaScript hack. Okay, I'm being sloppy. Uh, you might be a JavaScript hack if you've never heard of things like modules or dealt with closures much. Uh, you don't know the difference between like a triple equals and a double equals or a single equals in JavaScript. Um, there are a lot of things in JavaScript that can just plain hurt you. And that's not true in, in modern languages. If you think about modern languages, we're protected. Most of the time, stupid programs are because they're really big and it's people problems. Communication, you know, trying to figure out what's going on, figuring out requirements. But you don't build programs where all of a sudden it just dies mysteriously. It normally dies because of stupid people problems today. If you think about the past, there was this whole idea of a hacker. If you could make a big program, a big program was something that was pretty impressive because big programs are hard to make because you would go to a certain level and you'd lose control and it would just die. So programmers had to learn almost an anal discipline. You ran around just being really picky about details because if you ever messed up on garbage collection or on pointers or something, it'd kill your program. And in a mysterious way, you would never figure out. If it was a little program, you could figure it out. As they got bigger and bigger, it might take you months to figure out, in which case you gave up and rewrote it. Well, we're back to those days now with JavaScript sometimes. And there's ways to control it, and it can be controlled but it's not necessarily a, a nice protected environment that we're used to. So the context for today, let's assume a couple things. First of all, we're talking about JavaScript for client-side web development. Microsoft notably, about a year plus ago, threw out Windows 8. And they said, yeah, everybody wants to do JavaScript. Because we don't have all these browser differences, let's just do straight JavaScript. Well, web developers usually are used to like jQuery. That's about 80% of the market. And by the way, that dialect of jQuery versus straight JavaScript is enough different that you look at it and you go, that's not what we're used to. Well, web developers were used to the DOM, and they had different elements and a whole different platform. It was a dialect that was wildly different. But most of the time, we're going to be talking, and what's still dominant is JavaScript's not necessarily for web development, but it pretty much is. You can also have it for server-side, Node.js, things like that. 
And primarily, jQuery is a dominant tool. I already said that's 80% of the market. So they talk about some of the other ones, like Moo is 5% of the market. They're going, we got 5% of the market for websites. Okay, but that's small compared to the 80%. So if you want to learn JavaScript right now, jQuery on the client side is going to be your thing because it's dominating. Now, once you learn jQuery, do you want to learn something else? Sure, but learn something that's dominant first, that's a whole lot better than raw JavaScript, and it's the common platform, then you can go and branch off. Learn something, get comfortable, instead of learning 20 things and fail. Um, sometimes it's not so much where we're at, but where we need to go and look, and look in the future for where we can improve our JavaScript competence. Because again, I told you it's dangerous. So if we can improve our JavaScript competence doing little things, that's going to be a whole lot better than doing complicated stuff and going off the deep end and becoming a JavaScript snob. Those people exist, and I'm sorry, you would find a lot of things to attack with my JavaScript. That's okay. Um, but the whole idea that I care about is I care about controlling code. I would like to even have JavaScript under enough control that I can do what I want and that mere mortals can read my code. If that, if that happens, if I can control code and you can read my code when I'm done, I'm happy. That's control. Now, there comes a level where JavaScript, my control, will fall apart. So there's certain things I just wouldn't do, like single page applications. The tool sets would have to be more robust than what I'm used to. The browser independence and the browser quirks would have to be better for me to be comfortable. And I think that'll happen eventually. But right now is my skill level, and I think the skill level of the tool chain out there, that's a wild west that's really, really dangerous. So if you want to go hurt yourself, go make a single page application. Not a toy. I'm talking about a real line of business big app. Those are stinking hard, and I don't think we're right yet ready for that. Okay, so keeping control determines kind of what we want to do. So I'm not looking to repeat what's already available online. I'm going to give you a compliment. And I'm not looking for the idea of large spa development or these fancy things. And most of the time, spa development are, if you've done WPF, if you've done Silverlight, you like the idea of model binding and you like the idea of XAML and this binding is incredible. You can do that with Knockout and you can do that on pages. That's not for today, but as you start going to long lifetimes, let's say for days, that becomes a lot tougher because you have to deal with issues that I don't think most people are ready to deal with and by the time you hit them, the program got just too big, give up, you got to throw it away. That's not good for a project. So, my new toy. I was going to make a SV Nug Swagger. Yeah, it didn't happen. <laughs> but I've got a couple things I can show you with it. And the things I'm going to show you are just some of the pieces and parts, and that's more important. So the story is going to be shorter, but hopefully more concise. And I'd rather tell you a good story than overwhelming you. Because traditionally, I have 10 times too much material, try and shove it in, talk really, really, really fast. And then at the end, we go, eh, I missed all the good parts. So today, I've got a chance, I think, to talk about the good stuff. So, my new toy, yeah, not going to happen, web junk, where JavaScript lurks about is really important for understanding the context, why we have things like jQuery. Playgrounds, can I go out and play today? The, the toys that we have compared to even five years ago are phenomenal. Now, compared to Visual Studio and modern languages and straight app development, not web development, those toys are really stinking bad. But compared to what they were five years ago, they are getting good, and they're getting good fast. So the competence is going to start building up, and it is building up dra dramatically. Um, the whole idea of the CIA and the FBI, if we can track and chase deviant code, a lot of times the easiest thing to do in JavaScript is build it up piecewise and have some way to get some feedback. Because if you start running blind, you're going to get hurt really quickly. You can make interactive playgrounds, and that's what I want to kind of focus on a bit today. And then finally, controlling our code, some things like revealing module, a little bit about closure, just enough to get you dangerous, but just enough so you can feel good about it, because it isn't that complicated. And then this 1979, you know, think about the song way back when of 1999. Um, JavaScript and C. C in the days of 1979 is about where we're at. C still dominates. But have you ever programmed much in C lately? Everything's built and wrapped over C. I am hoping one of these days we'll have JavaScript the same way. Nobody has to program JavaScript again because we're using tools on top and we wrap the heck out of it so nobody sees it anymore. Least common denominator. If we've done that, life is good. So, forget that. 
web junk. The big picture, DA things. As you know, client is where our JavaScript is going to reside, and we normally do a request to the server. Wow. The server goes, makes a web dropping, and either dumps out XML or you know, JSON or something, or can throw in some other things. There's lots of different server approaches. The, the one that I'm used to, obviously, is using MVC on IIS. Um, but you have a rendered page or data. Now, when you do that, then, the DOM moment's here again, building a web page. And I want you to think about this. I'm not going to go through all the steps. This is the big picture. But when you're building a page, you've just gotten a page that got dumped back after your request. We have things being built up, right? Every page is a separate entity, and we're building everything up. And unless it's a single page application, we just keep throwing into divs and keep throwing into divs, and the page is long lived. Normally, when the page dies, everything gets torn down. So JavaScript starts up. When does JavaScript start up? That becomes important. So we've got a couple of things happening. We have DOM and layout. So the document object model isn't very fancy. If you have you know, your lists and your elements and your spans and your divs and your inputs, everything there is a DOM. And it's all set up in a hierarchy and it's all set up with HTML. That's your DOM. It's your junk. So when you start out, you've got to load the page. And when you load the page, one of the things that happens is layout. So when you're doing layout, most of the time, if you have CSS that's modifying your layout on the fly, every time you do a layout, that stops everything, and so loading becomes stinking slow. So normally what happens is you throw CSS up front. So once you do it, the style's determined, so as you do the elements, you don't have to keep changing your layout much faster in terms of page loads. Um, traditionally, you like to throw your JavaScript in the, in the bottom. Sometimes it doesn't work. But the other thing is, you really want to make sure you don't put comments in your JavaScript because then you expose things. It's like the dog that flips over and says, pet me, pet me. You're exposing yourself pretty much to the world if you put comments in your JavaScript on the page. It's just like, here's how to use your API. Wouldn't that be good? So one of the things that really happens is if you do not go through a bundling mechanism or a loading mechanism or something, and there's lots of ways to do that. Um, whether it's a preprocessor type approach or Microsoft bundling mechanism now. You want to make sure you strip off the comments, you compress things, um, combine a lot of your elements. You're not loading 50 things at once, but you're loading smaller numbers of items. Um, now to think about this again, different sites. So part of this was loading, and so the sequence is pretty obvious. Each time you go to a browser, browsers are different. You hear about all these different engines, like Internet Explorer has an engine, Safari is an engine that's on a system, Opera has its own engine, Chrome has its engine. Um, all of these have JavaScript implementations, supposedly according to the standard. Now I'll give you an example. One of the things you'll see today is get element by ID. That's raw JavaScript, which is raw straight from the browser. It turns out there ought to be a get element by class. Well, there is on most browsers, not all of them. The problem is Internet Explorer, at least the older ones, didn't support get element by class. So darn, when we load things into the DOM, JavaScript runs up, and different browsers have different JavaScripts with different methods. That's a problem. Next thing that happens is the DOM itself can be rendered browser specific. So there's all these different quirks in terms of styling, in terms of the way garbage collection works, which is a serious issue. Um, but not so bad if you do short page things. You know, if you just load the page, show the page, do a little JavaScript and go click, click, whiz, whiz, done. And then you throw the page away and go to a new page. That's not an issue. But the longer the page is there, the more the activities, the more the elements you're manipulating the worse this problem gets and the more you're going to have to handle it. So traditionally, when we do the hack of JavaScript, that's kind of the limit you can do without going to a deeper level. Um, so the DOM is going to have problems. The DOM is not generic. JavaScript is not generic. So that's where things kind of stood, things kind of stalled, and then jQuery came on the scene now that's one of those Microsoft-sponsored types of things. And so when you program in jQuery, I'm so used to jQuery, I look at JavaScript and go, ugh, because it just doesn't seem to make sense. So we can deal with inconsistencies by running libraries on top of raw JavaScript. Or you can put new 
languages on top of JavaScript that can emit JavaScript. There's all these ideas. The unfortunate part, though, is if you take jQuery, there's libraries based on jQuery. There's libraries based on YUI. So the thing is, once you start picking your libraries, you start pinning down the subset of, of the languages and tools and things you have available, and the tools you're using are different from somebody else's project. And that's one of these problems of it's just a monstrous system. But I would say that the dominant one is jQuery, and there are other ones out there in that 20% of the market. And JavaScript raw is probably in that other part of that 20% too. Okay, so complexity rises when you start doing things on multiple platforms with one code base. So you can do responsive. There's some libraries for that. Uh, JavaScript size, the bigger your code gets, the more libraries you use, you start running into namespace collision problems. Um, that becomes an issue. And then page lifetime, all of these cause Im immense complexity. And then garbage collection and cleanup. Browsers don't have infinite amounts of memory and compared to an app where you could throw like a gig out and say, big whoop, this becomes a problem. So garbage collection is one of the big ones, and like event handling and cleanup. Uh, just recently I was working on something where I had page loading in page loading in page, because it was cute and it was elegant, recently on a project. The only thing that I did differently was I started having forms, and I was changing forms dynamically, and I had forms and forms dynamically. Guess what? My eventing started getting to be a problem. I got everything working. And then when I found out, when I pressed my submit button the first time, it submitted once. When I pressed submit the second time, it did it twice. When I pressed submit the third time, it went four times and then eight. Guess what? That wasn't good. Um, I was close to fixing it. And then the more I thought about it, it's like, is this the way I'm going to control code? Or should I just find a simpler approach and make sure that I can control the code and avoid the eventing? So this is that issue of where do you go for control? And we need to keep moving up these standards. Uh, I wasn't doing cleanup in all my eventing, and so I had objects that were being disposed, but the events were still there, they were still firing, and it just snowballed. Okay, so for playgrounds, I'm going to change gears here, and let's find a really nice playground. One of the ones, if you haven't tried this, and I think a number of you have, is JS Fiddle. JS Fiddle is a nice little place. And it can give you kind of a context in terms of some of the things going on around here. This is an interactive playground, so you can play with JavaScript. And you can play around with the IDs of the DOM. And from a kind of a survey place, this is wonderful to show some simple ideas. So I've got myself a starter fiddle. And if you see what's happening here, and I got some slides for this, but I'm just going to avoid them, I think, as long as we can see. So this basically reasonably vid uh, visible. Okay, first of all, you get to pick your frameworks. So remember I said everybody builds on top of JavaScript? Let's look at some of these as an example. MooTools. Since this was built in MooTools, that's one of the ones they promote, and that's one of the ones with 5% of the market, which isn't shabby. Uh, jQuery is the other one. Prototype, YUI, which is from Yahoo, I believe. Glow, Dojo. I'm not experienced with any of these here. Um, you start getting some of these other ones. If you go down below, like Knockout. Knockout uses some other tools with it, but if you want to start playing with bindings, this is a good place to start looking at, at nice little bindings. And on pages, when you start having complex eventing, go look at the Knockout site and go look at, let's say, this page here. Start playing with bindings. It's probably the fastest way for you to learn how this system works. Okay, so there's a few others. Now, to get used to this system, it's not terribly tough, but there's a few things to get confused about. Okay, remember I talked about loading earlier? Loading's one of those issues. When do you start your code, or your JavaScript code, compared to when you load a page? Do you start in the beginning? Well, if you do that in the beginning, and if you have elements, there's no elements to search on. So if you try and, and uh, let's say, grab an element while it's loading, you may or may not get that element. So traditionally, we go like when the DOM is ready or there's like a loading or a ready event. So one of the things you could do is if you want to make sure the codes there are available at all times, you could do it on load, on DOM ready. You could do no wrap in the head, no wrap in the body. So this basically says, I'm going to build a DOM. The DOM 
remember not to be complicated. We're going to assume this is in a body tag. So in the Fiddler options here, we have a body tag here. Wow. So it just says this code in this top left area, it's just going to be inside a body tag. And by the way, it turns out the CSS is going to be in a style tag. And it turns out that the JavaScript, depending on where you put it on those options, is going to be in a script tag. Wow, not terribly complicated, but if you don't think about this, it's easy to get confused. So what's going to happen now is when I've got this little fiddle, and this one is one that I think I made public. Wow, it's not that exciting. But I've got this thing with a header that says, this is an example. I've got a paragraph, and the paragraph has a class of yub yub. Wow. Um, and it says gently down the street. And I've got a button called merrily button that says merrily. And if we go look in here, what you do traditionally is you'll go code in here. You don't have to save things. You can just keep things interactively, and you just keep going and run it. But if you do some coding, do an update here, and it'll change things and save this for you. So you've got your last change set up. Go do the run, and what it does is it loads the DOM, depending on how you configured things in your libraries, It'll then go load the JavaScript, and then it shows then my example code. So if I change something like gently down the street to, um, what's the word, what's an opposite of gently? Partially. Partially. Pardon? Harsh. Harshly. <coughs> Hopefully I've spelt that right. Can okay, you notice what happened? Absolutely nothing. If I do the update, I'm doing a save. Now we have harsh, harshly down the street, but a lot of times you can just type it and you just type run. It's just not being saved. So we have harshly down the street. So notice this is interactive, and once you get in the rhythm, it's not so bad. So the big things are configure it, figure out when JavaScript starts, um, and then you get to do some playing with it. And now I've got myself a little function. If we look at the code, let's see if I can get this going a little better. Yeah, I'm doing well. Ah, that's better. I got this dollars function. Okay, I know there's some jQuery people out there, so what in heck did I just do with this, this uh, dollars function? That's, that's basically the, the jQuery ready event. It's just waiting for things. So basically, the DOM is loaded, and then it says, here's where we go kind of at the end of the page. So you can have scripts, but the scripts won't run until everything's kind of loaded and running. So this is a pretty good habit. Sometimes if you need to do things before the DOM is loaded or early on, you put them in early. But this is, this is a shortcut for the you know, document ready. So you could do a dollar sign document ready function like this. And then what we're doing is we're just doing a quick little function on the fly in terms of this code, and notice it looks a lot like C, C++, C Sharp, Java, but it's not quite the same. You notice semicolons are different, braces are different. Real important thing, braces, if you try and do the brace where you put the brace under, don't, because it means something very different. This is a style for braces, it's not a style thing, it's a you're stupid or you're not kind of thing, because it won't run right, and there's some side effects. Um, one of the references that I have, um, Crockford has JavaScript the good parts. He takes the language like this and then takes just a very small subset. And he has a number of things. This is a good place to go. It's a good place to start. And says, here are the parts of the language you can trust. The rest of it, throw it away. And if you program within the good parts, you're in a safe subset. But he'll have a lot of little details in terms of like what you do here in terms of styles. Now, I just messed up. Didn't I? Yep. So if we do a JS hint, JS hint is like lint, but it's a little bit nicer, but it's not very nice. Probably should barf all over the place on that. I messed it up. Ha! Huh. So all I need to have was that open brace, and you notice that what it was detecting were things that were completely unrelated to what I caused a problem with. This is one of the wonderful things that they added on. I don't believe it was on the early versions of JS Fiddle. JS Hint here is great because you can start playing with JavaScript. Do a little bit of time, play with the button, and you can start seeing what are good stylistic things to do. 
Now, what are dumb stylistic things to do? And if you follow these habits, your JavaScript will be much more robust. Just this little piece right here. So when you start playing, this is a way to train you into doing things stylistically correct. Okay, you'll also notice something else here. We have this little function that runs. I got an alert, we press the button, and then we have this junk right here. What's happening with this var yub, sorry about that, is I'm taking, and this is a selector, and this is just like CSS. P is a paragraph element, right? When we go up to a, to our DOM, P is our paragraph element. Wow. But then it has a class of yub yub, and so when I do dot, dot means class. Pound sign means ID. So in jQuery, this is pretty much a jQuery kind of idea. If you do things in jQuery, this dollar sign, that if I had three or four paragraphs, it would give me all the paragraphs. It kind of just selects them all, and we can actually operate on every single one of them just automatically. So we don't have to sit there and, and do a for each and keep looping and doing all these goofy things. And by the way, some of those looping things would get you into trouble too. But what we're doing is we're selecting an element with jQuery. So if you're in raw JavaScript, you would basically get element by class, unless you're in the Internet Explorer, in which case you say, I'm in trouble. Um, but you can do this with get element by ID. So now we've got this element or we'd have this collection of elements, and then we just set up the text. So you notice, my yub text, which is this element here, my paragraph, I'm going to be taking the original text, I'm going to append merrily, 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 and I don't know that rhyme, so away we go. So when we run, when we run on this, press the button, that was my alert, and notice you can use that for diagnostics. That gets annoying really fast. You can also do console logging. So if you're in browsers, you can go into console with like F12 tools. And wow, we made some change to text. So what we've learned here is we can write functions. When the function loads is very important. So this shortcut here Whenever you see this kind of shortcut in jQuery, it just says, yeah, after the DOM is loaded and everything else, now go, go run your JavaScript. So it's telling you you're going to have everything ready. You can now manipulate all your DOM elements because they're already there. There are some other issues if you dynamically add elements and you want to attach things, um, but that's something outside of what we want to talk about today. So this is an example using JS Fiddle. So going back to my slides just really quick for playgrounds, One tool we can use is WebMatrix. Long time ago, I made a talk on ASP.NET MVC, and I used WebMatrix to talk about Razor. Razor is a cool little environment, and it's something you can get free from Microsoft. But if you want to just play with pages, and you want to do something simple, and you want something with some halfway decent tooling, um, WebMatrix now supposedly can do some things with like uh, Node.js and some other things. So you, supposedly they have made this much more flexible. But this is a good playground for just camping around when you don't want to just fiddle with projects and do all the, the scaffolding things to get everything set up that would be quicker. Um, this is something you may want to seriously consider checking out if you want to do some things and just mess around because it's a good place to learn. It's a good place to learn Razor before you go into ASP.NET MVC. Um, or if you're used to ASP.NET MVC, it's a good little tool that you can play with to do JavaScript specific events and play with the DOM because Razor can do all the HTML and HTML ways. It just allows you to throw a little server stuff in if you also want to do that. So it, it gives you a good alternative. So if you ever care about it, go to WebMatrix. The other one then is JS Fiddle, which you've already seen. So what did we learn? If you go to jsfiddle.net, you can log in. It's free. You can share your fiddles and make them public. Uh, you, can do your, you can also share your fiddles. So if you have problems, you can share it with somebody else and say, here's something that doesn't work. Why? And get some help. Or you can show a little technique or, or share it amongst, let's say, members of a group or, let's say, across a user's group here. Nice interface, dashboard where you can share fiddles. I can show you that. Um, main issue is just configuring, configuring the fiddle and, and see how this compares to your normal web environment. And this is the place I would say if you want to get started, in particular with JS Hint already configured without going to all the scaffolding and setup, this is great. 
And again, we already saw things. Top left was HTML, bottom was JavaScript. You notice I didn't do any CSS because I'm focusing on JavaScript today. But you can also use JavaScript to play with styling, figure that's going to be similar to elements and other things. Um, and then the results view is in the bottom right. And you always have to run or you have to save, which usually tends to run. And if you forget to save and you get out, you lost it, which isn't too bad. Um, so then there's some shortcuts. But I would really recommend, if you haven't done it, set up a fiddle and, and do a couple things with it. You'd be surprised. And if you want to play with the other toolkits, this is a good place to get started. It's very quick. It's very interactive. Um, so I already did my demo. OK. Some tools. Some of the things you can do, and I'm not going to do it so much today, is you can actually, like in Internet Explorer, go into their F12 tools, and there's a console. And once the console's up, you can actually go and do logging. And I started doing it, and then I messed up my code and broke it, so we don't care. Um, nice part about logging is if you've got the console window open on the browser, while you're doing things, you can just get kind of a log ticker tape. It's quick and dirty when you're developing. Not the same as doing, let's say, a production log. Really good for development when you're trying to figure out what in heck is going on. So I'll show you really quick the F12 tools. It'll be a different context, but just go and explore it. It's really easy. Play with it. You're going to learn more by playing than me trying to tell you about it. Um, so it used to be you just had page alerts, you know, pretty much, and just like, that's not fun. Then Fiddler came around, and Fiddler's been around for a long time. And it used to be, since that's so much of a hacking tool, that you put that into a corporation, they're going to just about shoot you for having it. But if you didn't have it, it's hard to develop, because at the time, they didn't have great tools. Firebug came out for Firefox. That was one of the, the first that at least I know about of the good tools. So if you're in Firefox, get Firebug. Just plain and simple, get Firebug. But now there's become the tool wars. Um, what was available four or five years ago compared to today is completely different. And it seems like every browser version is getting a, a new tool chain. Chrome is just increasing you know, leaps and bounds, and so is Internet Explorer. Um, the problem is I don't know the new Inter Internet Explorer interface. It does all the old stuff, but it, they've changed things around in Internet Explorer, I think, about 10 and 11. So in Internet, Ex Internet Explorer, if you hit F12 in the browser window, It'll pop up your tools, and you can detach it and do it in two windows. That's the way I'd recommend it. You can put breakpoints in, and you can go start staring at JavaScript code and just start tracing it through stepwise. F10, just like Visual Studio, steps you through. You can go into functions. You can get out of functions, everything you're used to. There's another nice feature, which started Internet Explorer 8, is you finally had uh, a network tab. And the network tab meant you just clicked record, and so whenever you did a request, it would see all the things are getting loaded or not loaded. And it would show you the HTTP numbers. You know, So if you, you sit there with a 300 series and you know it's caching, you go, ah, oh, shoot. i got to do something to stop the caching. Or you know, if it's giving you an error, it'll give you the, those codes, the four or 500 codes kind of thing. And you can actually trace through there and look at the response and the request and see what's going on. For bundling, this is tremendously useful. And I'm going to show you this in just a little bit. Chrome does the same kind of thing. So let's look at a couple of things here. Here I'm going to take an app, and this is a garbage app, but it's going to be great to show us a couple of things we want to do. So the first thing that I want to do, just get out of this one, is we've got an app. We go build it. It's actually going to build. And we just start it without debugging. And it's the Swaggerator. And right now as I can, whoa, I can actually copy supposed to be able to copy some stuff over. Ooh, I broke that code too. Shame on me. Actually, does a nice little copy paste and stuff before I broke that, and then I broke a bunch of other things. But I want to show a couple of things on diagnostic tools right now. So if we hit F12, this is the new interface for the F12 tools. You'll notice here that you've got this kind of window. We can detach it. I don't have room to detach it, but two, two screens is the way I would tend to do this. And if we click on this thing here, this icon that I'm hovering over, this is the one that gives you your network tab. So if we're in the network tab, we can just go record what we did. Well, I've already loaded the page. It's not doing a whole heck of a lot. But I can go Control F5, if I can see. Yeah, whatever. 
try that again. Record. Ha! That was all the excitement. So you saw what happened down below. This is in the F12 tools on the network. If I hit the record, if I forget to hit record, bad things happen. We can always control F5 and reload a page. And you'll notice a bunch of things. We're getting our methods. We have the results. 200 says, yeah, it worked. Wow. A couple of things to notice here. We've got all these bundles coming through with all that crud. I got bundling working. So if you ever want to see if bundling's working, this is a good way to do it. You just go look and see what the response is on like one of the pages that has all the bundles set up. And it gives you one of the ways. Otherwise, you're going to be sitting there forever going, is it bundling? Is it not bundling? How is it working? Did I get my right file? Why can't my, my jQuery run? Because I don't seem to see it. Well, because you didn't download it. You know, it didn't get bundled or it didn't get added in. I recommend bundling for Microsoft. And again, or if not, use the equivalent tools on what are the whatever platform you have to minify, to pull off your comments, and to combine files. So that's what we tend to do. Now, a couple of things here. Notice here that I am bundling, so I am minifying all these things into packages. Well, cool, let's try something different. With this app that is absolute garbage right now, I could sit there and go into my web config, and two things. If I'm in release mode, which I am, but I can sit here in system web, there's a, a settings, compilation, debug, false. You generally want to set up your configuration, so deployment to production, always set debug to false, right? Otherwise, you're going to not minify, you're going to throw all your comments in, you're also going to throw in a lot of diagnostic information for hackers to hack your site. And for a lot of us that are trying to write sites that need to be fairly robust and secure, that's a bad thing. So all we have to do here now is we go true, so the best way to do this is set up for your deployment for configuration, set it automatically for true and false so you don't screw it up. Now if I set this to true, we go back, sorry, I'll get there. This was still in release mode, but I set debug to true, or if I set in debug mode, okay, so you've got to have that set and release mode to get production release with the minification going. Now all of a sudden that page, okay, whoop, set the network tab, record, control F5, yeah, make me a liar. Probably ought to click on that. What I did there was I was on the F12 tools and I hit control F5. That didn't work too well, did it? But notice here the difference. First of all, the number of files. And second of all is I'm getting all my files that were specified in my layout. I'm getting, you know, some CSS files. I'm getting my modernizer, my jQuery, and, and the version. So the thing is, figuring out how that loads is very, very important. And a lot of times, doing it unminified, when you start looking at your actual source code page in the Internet Explorer or whatever tools you're using, the unminified version you can actually trace through because you can read the JavaScript. When you get into production, you want to save it and hide away the JavaScript, so the minified is going to be a whole lot safer. Plus, it's going to be much faster. So we can see a lot of things very quickly. The other thing that we can see is if we go into the details, like select something, go into details, we can look at you know, the request and response, response body, we can look at cookie information if we have the security. If, if we don't have you know, the, the security tokens and things, you're not going to be able to see the security information. Um, lots of things can be explored here. And for security standpoint, you ought to do it at least. But also to understand the bundling in particular with a lot of these JavaScript libraries, you'd like to use them as libraries. But if you don't keep track with a summary of what you're actually loading, you're going to hurt yourself because you can spend hours and hours trying to figure out what's going on just realize the file didn't get loaded. So this is one of the first places to go. You can also sit here and you can actually go in and do debugging of scripts. You can go debugging of the DOM so we can go select elements and, and actually see where they're at. So I'm not very good in this version of it. You can actually do profiling. So you notice one of the things that was happening when we were loading, um, you can actually see the, the rendered CSS. So if you have CSS that's going through a hierarchy, you can see that very easily. 
I was going to spend some time on Chrome tools, but guess what? It's got the same tools. In fact, if anything, some of the Chrome tools right now are better. One of the coolest things that's, that's now starting to come out is if you're starting to do long-lived pages and you start caring about what's happening with lifetimes of things and garbage collection, memory profilers that you often have to spend a lot of money for. Like if you remember like the ANTS profilers and things for memory and such that, that you, you buy because the Microsoft ones stink, um, well, it turns out there are memory profiles now in the Chrome tools. I don't know about Internet Explorer because I haven't cared about it yet. But you can actually look at garbage collection and how that's starting to work and seeing what's being retained and what's being kept. Wow, that's pretty cool. That didn't exist not that long ago. And since it's so convenient, I mean, this is just in the browser. How hard is that? Now, time-wise, I'm getting closer to the end of my time, so I want to do a few more things here. Let's go back to the slide deck. Yeah. Control. These are just going to be some simple things, and like I said, Crockford's JavaScript, the good parts. And there are a bunch of other things, like there, there's some design patterns. Uh, design patterns in Java, there's a, there's a couple of books like that that are wonderful. I've got a list of a few references, places to go to get started. In the beginning, learn JavaScript. Don't worry much about the DOM, because if you do, you're going to get confused if you go to jQuery, or just realize everything will be different. But what I've already talked about, most of us start out as hackers, and for simple things, hackers work, but it gets really confusing and frustrating because it never does what you quite expect. So if you can start using these, these F12 tools, you can actually set breakpoints in the JavaScript in those, the F12 tool or the equivalent uh, Chrome tools. Use those. I mean, it makes it really, really simple. If you know that event's going to hit, you know, set a breakpoint on there. If it doesn't hit, then you go, something's not getting there. Look at the network commands coming in. Between the two of those, you're going to be able to pin it down pretty quickly of what's going on. You can also, once you get onto those tools, like on the JavaScript, what I didn't show you is you can actually look at the elements, but most of the time with JavaScript, a lot of the elements have so many stinking things hanging off those objects that it's a little hard to trace through those. So that's a little bit for experience to go through. Um, so if you make code in JavaScript without comments, and some of my examples here don't have comments, that's a bad thing, but remember, without bundling, comments traditionally weren't being used because it's dangerous. Okay, put the code away, include the code, bundle the code, minify the code so you're, you're protected, and the comments don't cost, cost you anything except a little bit during compile time, whoop. Um, so we can avoid that no comments problem, put the JavaScript off the page, and then let's talk about organization now. So the middle tier is if we can start using jQuery consistently, you know the difference between jQuery and JavaScript, and start using the good parts of JavaScript, and then if you're going to use any one module, use a revealing module pattern. It's great for doing binding. So if you're using Knockout JS or some of the binding frameworks, it just works. The other thing is this means the same thing. You know, this inside an object usually just means the object. This in JavaScript is a place to hurt yourself. Different, different patterns and different types of ways to modularize your code will have this mean whatever in heck it feels like at the time. Revealing module makes sense from us in terms of object-oriented programming. It looks the same, even though this is a different kind of, it's prototypal inheritance, it's not standard inheritance that we're used to, or it's kind of a prototypal system. Um, learning some of the patterns for JavaScript and the idea of closure is pretty essential here. And if you want to, once you get to this middle stage, you can do just about anything you want to, decide where you want to go. As an expert, if you want to do spa, go ahead and hurt yourself. Wait for somebody else to do it and get bloody, and then go in. Um, tool builders. I'm impressed with a lot of the, tool out, the tools out there. There's some incredible code. You throw a couple lines of JavaScript, and great things happen. You can take a table, and all of a sudden now the table is just interactable, scrollable. I'm using a couple things right now, JS data tables. And then there's the JavaScript snobs. They learn a subset, and they want to attack you when you do something wrong. It's like, get a life. Okay, hints and dangers. I already said this, bracing is not optional in JavaScript. Be very careful and be pretty anal when you go to bracing because it does make a difference. The other thing is the var keyword. This is a dynamically typed language. Var is not an option. Be very, very careful. 
if you ever miss a var, you can just say variable name equals something, and guess what? You just attach something to the global scope, which is usually your Windows object, which means it's available everywhere, and anybody else that has that same name, it's going to clobber over it and do unexpected things. So really watch out. That is murder. So be pretty picky about that. Know about sco scope and lifetime. If you use a var and you put something in a block of a function, it's usually going to have a control lifetime. And you can have control lifetimes and control scoping. And that's one of the keys to get under control. So I'm going to show you a little example here just to get you going. So again, the missed the var. JavaScript and jQuery are different. I want to show you an example that's going to be jQuery that did the same thing we did. That last example with the fiddle was in jQuery. I want to flip it to JavaScript. And there are a bunch of differences. And I'll just kind of highlight a few of them. And then JavaScript, we really need comments because the language doesn't help, the DOM doesn't help. If you don't comment, who's going to read your code? I mean, two days later, you can't read your own code. Imagine somebody else trying to support you. OK, so back. Okay, if you remember this code in terms of what was happening, this is jQuery. Okay, it's using this jQuery function. Whenever you see the dollar sign, I just screwed that up. I'm going to go off this page. Whenever you see the dollar sign and tricks like that, jQuery, guaranteed pretty much, because that's uh, an alias for jQuery. Um, when you start having those selectors that look like CSS selectors, um, that's always going to be jQuery. So it's basically getting a hold of elements, manipulating elements, getting information, changing elements. You can insert things in very quickly. And if you notice, when I did this update in the text, I was just tweaking on the DOM then. You're know, just shoving it in. jQuery selectors are really stinking slow. So whenever you get a chance, if you have to make a selector call twice, make the call once, put it in a variable. Always. Um, right now, if I don't save this, I'm fine, but I don't remember. So if you do, you'd know more than I do. I've been, I I'm the stage where I'm reasonably functional on it. Okay, I'm going to go back to the dashboard and good. This is a very similar example. Notice in the bottom right. Does this look the same or what? But the code, and it turns out the DOM is pretty much everything that's the same, except I made an ID instead of a class. I don't remember which one I had. This one is a JavaScript version that's just about equivalent. Not quite, but pretty darn close. First of all is we're making var my click function. We got the alert. We got the, the var. But now, document get element by ID. This is all one line and inner HTML. So instead of saying HTML, it's inner HTML. So whenever you see inner HTML, jQuery, I mean JavaScript. If you see HTML, that's jQuery. Those little things will drive you absolutely nuts. So whenever you see a little help on the web, keep track of which one's JavaScript, which one's jQuery. Um, here's another document, get an element by ID, setting inner HTML to you know, I'm just kind of patching it all up. And then we have this little on click event. And instead of being a click event, jQuery is an on click JavaScript. What does it do? Well, when we go run it, throw some text in. Wow. I like the jQuery better. The, the thing is, jQuery also hides browser differences, it hides JavaScript and DOM differences, and sometimes. Yeah, those are the main two, JavaScript and browser differences. And it has an incredible number of functions that make things a lot more convenient so you're not having to sit there and write code and then test every single stinking browser because somebody's usually done that for you. There's still edge cases, but you're 99% farther along. Okay, next thing that I want to show you real quick in terms of control, which is really important, is still set as example two, and this is sad. This is a simple revealing module. This code is lame beyond belief in terms of what it's doing. Notice here, 
Here's the result when we're done. This just auto ran. It says Howdy 3. Really exciting. So what we do is we have this div my result that's saying Howdy 3. So we've got this little thing here, and this is a singleton. There are different variants. I can make an object revealing module. This is the easiest form. And this uses an ID of closure. So I'm going to be able to show you a couple things, and this is a good place to kind of start winding down. First of all is, we could also put this in a namespace. There's some namespace ideas because name collision is a real problem. But I'm starting to hide things, and this is a module. This is acting more like a class. It's storing local data, and it's using an effect called a closure. So what's going to happen is we have this outer function built. SVNUG is now a function. Because, you know, objects in JavaScript can hold functions, data, it doesn't make any difference. So we've got this function, and it has a data piece, variable i, inside this object. It has a function called update that just increments by one, and by the way, I can do i++. Plus plus. And I have another method called get count, which is just going to get the count when I'm done. This is about as simple as I can make to illustrate revealing module and the idea of closure. And there's variants of this, but this is the one I'd say if you ever want to spend some time, this is the one to learn because it'll get you an awful lot of the way. And what's happening is when you return things, this return statement is just saying, you know, set up some pairs here. I'm going to expose update and get count to the outside world. Okay, what's update? It's a function. What's get count is a function. Now, since that was made public, there's, there's some issues on the garbage collector. When we expose an object to the outside world, all the objects that it attaches to stay in scope, and the garbage collector won't catch them. Okay, this sounds complicated, but it's not. So it just says, okay, well, update plays with i, and get count plays with i, so i is in scope because we exposed it. So something that was hidden now kind of got exposed, but i got retained only because the functions are kept. We only on the outside world see the functions. So we have encapsulation. This is cool. The value of i, when we first ran this, i is set to zero. i is retained after the invocation of this function. So what happens is the magic happens is we could do a new object, or in this case, this is auto exit executing. This is a singleton. So when we run this code, we build the object and we just disappear. But what happens is update and get count were exposed with that return statement. And that variable i is now retained. That is closure. It turns out update knows about the outer function's data. So if an inner function knows about the outer function's data, and now that data doesn't go away because it's in scope, we now have ourselves an object that's persisting with data that's persisting. Cool, huh? Whoever invented that the first time and there was a name and I forgot it, this is major cool and this is one of the ways to control code. Um, there are people that say prototypes faster than revealing module and it's a, a different style of doing modules. Not necessarily true. But this is probably the safest one and mentally closest to what you're used to. And I would say get comfortable with this fast and use it. There's a lot of tricks you can do with this tool piece. So we got the idea of closure, right? Inner functions with outer functions keeping things retain the scopes and the variables persist, and we've also controlled scope and lifetime with this, and we now have an object. So you can build individual objects, or in this case with the self-executing, it's a single object. You can throw this on the page and stuff data in there, and it'll stick around until the page dies. Cool. That's a whole lot better than making a whole lot of magic divs and throwing things in the, in the divs with data IDs and stuff. You just throw in the object, and if you need to, then just take JavaScript and bind it and do whatever you want to with the data. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so when I'm calling this then, my outer object is svnug. My inner functions were the update and get count that were exposed, so I just say svnug update, svnug update, so I started with 0, 1, 2, 3, and at the end, I call my get method, and notice here, it's the idea of equals and stuff. You can take strings, and you can take integers and stuff, and it'll just go cast and munge for comparisons, and it will also do that for operators. You can get some really goofy results if you're not careful. But at the end, we just kind of appended it, and then with the jQuery approach, I just stuffed it in with HTML. Remember, inner HTML, JavaScript, HTML, jQuery. And so at the end, it just said, howdy3. Not that terribly impressive, but what we just learned is a way to control code. This is very important. 
closure is very important. And if you've got control out of this, and if you bundle this now, you all of a sudden have ways to put your code away so you can now start putting comments in. You now have to start having a controllable ecosystem. So I would say as a basis, revealing module, bundling by however means you do it, and make sure you've got it under control, and then using these different tools to make sure the bundling and everything works. You start having control on an object, and where it was going to go next, which we ran out of time is, uh, jQuery is really nice for doing things with Ajax, sending data back and forth, JSON pages. So if you want to do a partial page load or update, that's outside of the scope of the story, but I was going to run over time. So we're pretty much done except for a, one little story to finish it up. I've got like three minutes. See if I can do this. And if it is, it'll be about my shortest talk. I thought this was going to be a half an hour. From current slide, I couldn't find that. Okay. C days. Long time ago, the story is that in Bell Labs, you had a whole bunch of really smart people. Go language. There's still people from that original team still kicking around like at Google and such, doing really good work. But there's a big project, Multics, that failed. And so they're like, ooh, now what do we do? Out of desperation was built Unix and C, and it was done under basically constrained conditions. They had like a PDP-8 or something at the time. And compared to a PC or a calculator of today, uh, this thing really was slow. Um, they made some very nice ideas, and they, they set up the whole tool approach, do things compositional. But it was easy to build on the little. You can make little C programs and little C widgets and control them, but as they got bigger and bigger, I made a program that you know, had a stack of source code. I remember once that was in C that you know, the source code stack was about three or four feet high. It was on a bootable Unix system. You booted Unix on a floppy, you booted the program on a floppy, and it couldn't die in three months. Guess what? That hurt. But those were those days, and by the way, that was post-1979. I'm not quite that old. Um, but writing big programs was really, really hard. Controlling memory was really hard. If you ever had pointers going over your code, because it could real easy, there was no control over that. It would just wipe over your code, and now all of a sudden, sooner or later, you started executing that code that no longer is code, but it's data. Boom. Okay, so it turns out it was very hard to debug and understand. Hackers could control code. That was when hackers were the elite ones because they could build the bigger programs that nobody else could build. Not because of people, but because of technology. It was, it was really hard to control it well enough. Um, and they started building tools. Well, today, we're building on a C foundation, still this dominated. It's starting to switch away. C is still, I'd say, 50 to 70% of our software ecosystem is built on top of C foundation. But nobody seems to program in it anymore. And that's OK, because that tool was tough. Um, we develop on tools now, not in the raw. So what happened in JavaScript, we went right back to it. So where you want to look at today, jQuery is the right step, maybe not the end note. So if there's a better tool than jQuery eventually comes out that lets us control our code better and wrap on top, we ought to think about that. So, so that's where everybody's kind of searching. Everybody's trying to make something else. Um, and JavaScript right now is just least common denominator. Good parts of the language is there. jQuery is one of the first of the major tools that got to, to be dominating. We're getting better tools and tools built on these tools. If you notice, we're libraries on libraries on libraries. The problem is which one? Um, wrapping and generating JavaScript like TypeScript. Every major corporation seems to have something that emits Java or JavaScript code on the top. Sooner or later, we're going to get back to the level of what we can do in net with JavaScript. But right now, those people say JavaScript's so great compared to where it was, yes. But I'm sorry, we're still maybe in the early 80s. We're past the 70s, but we're in the early 80s. And that's a shame. But I think there's good opportunity. And so today was to tell you a story, give you a couple of core things and where to go. And for references, JavaScript, the good parts. JavaScript patterns is one of the other ones. There's a bunch of other things. jQuery. I've never been too appreciative of the books. A lot of times you just play with jQuery once you know the core of the language and just start exploring what you can do. The big part is you may have to go to a book for events. Um, Pluralsight has some nice videos. In particular, they've got some on patterns that go through a lot of those. And like I said, really key on revealing module. I made 8 o'clock.
So it worked. So that's the end of my talk.